thunder of jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... <laughs> a loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The see, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. Our story opens today in the typical American community of Frostbite Falls, Minnesota. Like all small American towns, Frostbite Falls has a city hall, a church, a bowling alley, and a movie house. The only difference is that in Frostbite Falls, they're all in the same building. But the other downtown building holds the town's newspaper, the Frostbite Falls Picayune Intelligence, and its editor, Colonel McCornbone. Stop the presses! Stop the presses! What's up, Colonel? A big scoop? Nope. Election results? Nope. Cat up a tree? Nope. Then how come you want me to stop the presses? Because we're broke, that's why. Broke? How come? We print 50,000 copies a day. Yeah, but we only sell 25 of them. It was true. At that moment, the stacks of unsold Picayune intelligences reached as high as the building itself. I need something to boost my circulation, Mokesby. How about a shot of adrenaline? Not my personal circulation, the papers. What can we do to boost our sales? Well, how about sponsoring a buried treasure hunt? I've got it, Mokesby. We'll sponsor a buried treasure hunt. How do you like that? I couldn't like it better if it was my own idea. So in a short while, Frostbite Falls was plastered with posters telling about the great event. And two of the first citizens to read about it were our heroes, Rocky the Flying Squirrel and his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. Look at that, Rock. Find the Picayune pot containing a million dollars and win a genuine reconditioned Stern's Night runabout. Did you really bury a million dollars in a pot, Colonel McCornpone? You bet I did, Rocky boy. Of course, it's Confederate money. But that flashy car is really real, huh? Absolutely, Bullwinkle. It looks a little old-fashioned. Of course, it's the 1910 model. They don't build them like that anymore. I can see why. Now, be sure to read the Picayune Intelligence for clues. We sure will, Colonel. And they did, and so did everybody else. For the first time in years, the paper sold every copy as soon as it appeared on the street. Park Street, got your... Paper? Latest clues in treasure, huh? Well, let me have a paper. No, you don't. This one's mine. It's a great success, Rocky. The paper's selling like hotcakes, eh, Mokesby? It sure. That's what I'm printing it on. You mean... Yep, Colonel. We've run plumb out of paper. But this is awful, Mokesby. Yeah, I'm running out of hotcakes, too. What do we do, Rocky? Our first chance to really sell papers, and we don't have any. Now, wait a minute, Colonel. You have a whole stack of papers right in the back of the building, don't you? Of course, but they're old newspapers. Look here. Some of them go back five years. Yeah, but look at the headlines, Colonel. International tension increases. Cost of living up again. Big traffic accident. Local dog chases local cat over a local fence. Say. You see? They're the same headlines that are in today's papers. Then we can sell these papers today. Sure. You can print the contest rules around the edges. Rocky, you're an authentic phenomenon. No, I'm more of a squirrel. And following Rocky's suggestion, the colonel reissued his newspapers with great success. But our three friends were unaware that a short distance away, a group of very undesirable characters were preparing to destroy their peace and quiet. Everybody in his work clothes? Yes, yes boss. boss. Everybody got it implements? Right, right boss. boss. 
Then let's go. Well, who are these sinister figures? Maybe we'll find out next time. Not if I can help it. When we see a tisket a casket or the berry box. Last time you remember, Colonel McCornpone, editor of the Frostbite Falls Picayune Intelligence, sponsored a treasure hunt to boost sales of his newspaper. Gee, a pack containing a million dollars. In Confederate money, of course. Plus a genuine Stearns Knight runabout. The 1910 model, completely renovated. Renovated? Two new inner tubes and we polished the brass. And here's our first clue, Bullwinkle. The Picayune pot can now be found buried six foot underground. But where, Colonel McCornpone? <laughs> That's the puzzle, Rocky. So our heroes set to work to dig in all the likely places, only to find that everybody else in town had the same idea. How about digging right here, Bullwinkle? A good guess, buddy, but I was here first. How about right over here? Right over where, Jack? It's no use, Bullwinkle. Everybody else is digging in the most likely spot. Well, then I'm going to dig in the most unlikely spots. But that's ridiculous, Bullwinkle. I know, but that's all there is left. So Bullwinkle sought out the least likely spots in town to dig a hole. He dug in the Frostbite Falls City Park. He dug under the Possum Trot Memorial Highway. He even dug in Scully's Swamp. Rocky, I hit it! I hit it! The treasure? No, water. But Bullwinkle's most sensational digging was done in an open field outside of town where suddenly... Break! Gone the cool, Rocky! I've struck oil! Hokey smoke! I'm rich! Rich! Yes, it really was oil. Flowing out in a great gusher and small wonder, for Bullwinkle had been digging right outside the Ponsford Oil Company refinery and had broken one of their main lines. Boy, you know what I'm going to get first, Rocky? Yeah, 30 days. Sure enough, the moose was lodged in the town calaboose until... Hey, Bullwinkle, the sheriff says you can go now. I can? Yeah, Mr. Ponsford won't press charges on one condition. Keen, what is it? That you won't dig no more of them holes looking for the picayune pot. You mean I'm out of the contest? Looks that way, Bullwinkle. But I got my right. You also got 30 days. Yeah. Funny how that works out. So in the interest of public safety, Bullwinkle was ordered not to dig any more holes. Shucking Dan Cobbs. If it'll make you feel better, Bullwinkle, I won't dig any either. So Rocky and Bullwinkle became the only two people in town who weren't digging for the Picayune pot. Matter of fact, people came from as far away as Tadpole Center and Possum Trot just to dig in Frostbite Falls. Some even seemed to have come from farther away than that. Hey, buddy, is this where they digging for a million bucks in Confederate money? That's right, mister. Okay, boys, this is the spot. Let's get started. And as our heroes watched, the sinister-looking gang began to dig right through the pavement. Why didn't I think of that? You know, Bullwinkle, I think I've seen that face somewhere before. Oh, if Rocky had only remembered, that face was displayed prominently just a few scenes ago on the wall of the Frostbite Falls Sheriff Station, for it belonged to Babyface Braunschweiger. But that's really Boris Badenoff, notorious forger, thief, bank robber, gunman, and litterbug. Well, gee whiz, Nick, nobody's perfect. And now here he is in Frostbite Falls with a brand new gang of cutthroats. Yeah, the light-fingered five, minus two. Which way do we dig now, boss? Let me check map. But, 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 but that's a map of the town bank. You, you're not. That's right, Junior. We're going to rob the bank. You were thinking maybe of squealing on us, yes? Wh why, wh why, no, I... Uh... Uh, uh, be sure to be with us next time for Bank Busters or the Great Vaults! Ah! Well, the Frostbite Falls Daily Paper, the Picayune Intelligence, really started something when it buried a pot containing a million dollars in Confederate money. As a sales booster, the idea was a smash. People stood in lines to get the latest edition with clues as to where the pot could be found. But it wasn't a very good idea for the town, for treasure hunters had soon dug Frostbite Falls full of deep holes and tunnels. Of course, nobody minded when the statue of General Bumble fell from sight. Or when a string of light poles suddenly dropped ten feet. Makes the light better for reading. But they began to change their minds when a whole housing track called Mountain View Homes sank to roof level. But the citizens really got up in arms when the crumbling surface began to affect the baseball scores. Steer right. But that pitch was on the ground, Dump. I don't care. It came across right at your belt buckle. Whoa. Soon an angry crowd collected at the newspaper office demanding the pot be dug up and the contest called off. I'd be happy to oblige good people, only... Only what, McCornpone? I can't remember where I buried it. And so the search went on. The only two people in town who weren't concerned were Rocky Squirrel and his pal Bullwinkle, for the moose had been ordered not to dig anymore. I just can't stand it, Rock. I know 
I could find that pot. Maybe you better go visit your relatives in Ponca City, Bullwinkle. That'll take your mind off the treasure. Yeah, guess maybe you're right. And the despondent moose packed his straw valise and started out of town on his bicycle. On the way, he passed what seemed to be a very earnest group of diggers. Find anything, fellas? Not yet, but it won't be long now. Well, good luck. And Bullwinkle pedaled away, little realizing that those diggers were in reality an evil gang called the Light-Fingered Five Minus Two. Their leader was that all-round thief and safecracker Boris Badenov. Please, Babyface Braunschweiger, the Minnesota monster. Well, Bo uh, uh, Babyface was really digging beneath the Farmers and Swineherds National Bank in order to rob it. How much farther we got to go, Babyface? Should be there now, Spike. Swing pickaxe one more time. Didn't I told you? Get the dynamite ready. Meanwhile, back in his little cottage, Rocky was already getting lonesome for Bullwinkle. Gee, I sent him off all by himself. Suppose he gets lost. I better follow him. And the soft-hearted squirrel started off to find his friend. Unfortunately, the first place he stopped was the hole being dug by Bo uh, a Babyface's gang. Hey, any of you fellas see a moose go by here? Hey, Babyface, you know who that is? Do I know who that is? Oh, boy, do I know who it is. That's Rocky the Flying Squirrel. He's rough on rats. We better get out of here. Nonsense, Nick. Invite the little chappy into the hall, Three Finger. The boss wants you should come into the hall with us. I'm sorry, but I can't. Who? The boss wants you should come into the hall. Oh. And in a twinkling, our hero was bound and blindfolded. Now, Slog. If you will be so kindly to light the fuse, we will be on our way. Gee, you're going to use the same dynamite to break into the bank and blow up the squirrel? Well, you know, he's a low-budget show. That voice. Where have I heard that voice? Well, it looks as if Rocky has only a few seconds to remember, for the fuse leading to the dynamite is growing shorter and shorter. And so, unfortunately, is our time. Be sure to see our next episode, Sweet Violence, or The Yeg and I. Well, things looked bad for our hero last time, didn't they? You said it. Rocky has been blindfolded and tied up in a hole under the Farmers and Swineherds National Bank right next to a charge of dynamite with a burning fuse. You said it. And the fiend behind all this is Boris Badenov, alias Babyface Braunschweiger, the Minnesota monster. You said it. Come on, fellas. Last one out of the hole is a dead squirrel. Quickly, the gang scrambled to safety, leaving Rocky alone with the dynamite. Shh. Gee, if I can just get to the fuse, maybe I can put it out. And the fearless squirrel inched his way toward the sound of the sizzling fuse. First, he tried sitting on it. Shh! Ow! That'll never do. He even tried to pull the fuse out of the dynamite, only to find that it was a lot longer than he thought. Gee, I guess I'm really a goner this time. Help! Help! But the wily baby-faced Badenoff had roped off the area above and no one could get near enough to hear Rocky's cries. Meanwhile, on his way to Ponca City, Bullwinkle was pedaling slowly up the slopes of George Washington Hill. Boy, this is quite a grade. Uh, needs a little more moose muscle. But just as Bullwinkle stood up to push hard on the pedal, his bicycle chain snapped. <laughs> and Bullwinkle's bike began to rush backward down the hill at frightening speed. Of course, still facing forward, he had no idea where he was going. Sure I do. I'm going down. But you can't see where you're heading. On the other hand, I get a grand view of where I've been. Meanwhile, in the hole under the bank, Rocky watched in desperation as even the now lengthened fuse grew shorter and shorter. Shh. Hey, baby face. That fuse has taken an awful long time. Somebody might go down and rescue that squirrel. Nonsense. Nobody but idiot would go near hole with those signs around it. But at that moment... Gangway! Look out wherever you are! And Bullwinkle's speeding bicycle crashed through the guardrail and right down into the hole. Who is it? Who's there? Oh, I'm not sure, but I think it's me. Well, who's me? Who's you? You's a Rocky the Flying Squirrel. Bullwinkle, you've come to save me. I uh have. -huh. I mean, I have. In a twinkling, Bullwinkle had freed Rocky, and our two friends scrambled wildly up the ladder as the fuse burned shorter and shorter. So nobody but an idiot would go down there, eh, baby face? Well, look at him. Yeah, I guess you're right. They must have put out fuse. Come on, remember, he who hesitates is lost. And the gang climbed into the hole again. You got any other bright sayings, baby face? Of course. You can't keep a good crook down. 
Golly, Bullwinkle, those fellers are gonna rob the bank. Oh, that's terrible. You know what we gotta do, don't you? Sure, we gotta withdraw our money quick. No, we gotta warn them. Why? They know they're gonna rob the bank. No, we have to warn the people in the bank. Come on. Oh, that's very astute of you, Rocky. You mean astute, Bullwinkle. You may be astute. I am astute. Well, that was certainly true enough, for Bullwinkle's way of warning the bank was to rush in and shout, Hey, everybody, it's a stick-up. Instantly, the bank guards began firing at our friends. That was the wrong thing to say, Bullwinkle. Boy, some people are sure touchy. And as our heroes crouched under a hail of lead, in the basement below, the light-fingered five minus two was once again and hard at work carrying off bag after bag of greenbacks. Good action, that's green box. Be sure to be with us next time for Many a Thousand Gone or the Hall of Fame. Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Just enough left to tell them who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop. and quiet of Frostbite Falls has been pretty well shattered these last few days. First, Colonel McCornpone, editor of the Picayune Intelligence, sponsored a treasure hunt to find a buried pot containing a million dollars in Confederate money. Plus a 1910 Stearns Night Roadster reconditioned. Then the good citizens of Frostbite Falls tried so hard to find the Picayune pot that they riddled the town with holes and tunnels. Here's a spot where nobody's dug yet. Hey, where'd you come from? I'm digging from the bottom up. Next, a gang of bank robbers led by Babyface Braunschweiger... Alias Boris Bedenov, folks. ...took advantage of the hole-digging spree to burrow under the town bank in order to rob it. And finally, when Rocky and Bullwinkle tried to warn the bank, Bullwinkle said the wrong thing... Hey, it's a stick-up! ...and the bank guards immediately opened fire on our friends. Hey, wait a minute! It's me! Hold your fire! I recognize that helmet. That's our boy, Rocky. And his boy, Bullwinkle. What's this all about, Rocky? Robbers, crooks, thieves. Oh, come, come. There's no need to call names. Not you, Mr. Friendly. You have bandits in your basement. Safe crackers in my cellar. You, yeah, and villains in your vault. Come on, man. And our friends dash for the basement of the bank, only to find it empty. Hot diggies, they're gone. Yes, there's only one thing. What's that? The money's gone with them. After them, Bullwinkle, they can't have gone far. True enough, for at that moment, Boris and the light-fingered five minus two were just pulling away from the bank in their getaway car. Give me a hand, Bullwinkle. I gotta catch him. Right, Rock. And the mighty moose seized his friend and tossed him high into the air. In a moment, Rocky was flying after the retreating car and slowly overtaking it. But the cunning crook was prepared for even this eventuality. Okay, three-finger, fire. Fortunately for our hero, the shell burst fell short of him. He's too high, baby face. Raskalnikov. Here, use special high power shell. Okay, baby face. And the robber loaded his terrible weapon, aimed carefully, and fired. The recoil blew open the gun barrel and drove the getaway car into a wall. But it had done its dreadful work well. The shell burst right in front of our hero, and dazed and shaken, he spun toward the ground. I finally got that meddlesome squirrel. Oh, boy, it's a black leather day. But where do we get another car? Where did we get this one? We stole it. So steal another one. But where? Sure enough, Boris had forgotten that there were very few cars in Frostbite Falls. You mean we gotta make our getaway by hitchhiking? Baby face, we're disappointed in you. Come, come, fellas. Do you think I'll let you down? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Where is your fate? Where is your throne? Where is the car? Indeed, Babyface Braunschweiger might have met a sorry fate right then if he hadn't spotted something in a nearby window. Look, there's the car! Sure enough, they were standing right before the office of the Picayune Intelligence, and there in the window was the Stearns Knight runabout. 
That's a getaway car? Blackguards can be choosers. Come on. And in a jiffy, the gang had driven the old auto right through the window and were on their way out of town. But they're getting away, Bullwinkle. Tut, tut, tut. And may I add, tut, Mr. Fremley. Remember, Rocky Squirrel is on their trail. They haven't got a chance. Little did Bullwinkle know that directly above him, the unconscious form of our hero, our hero, mind you, was hurtling nearer and nearer to the ground. Be with us next time for Down to Earth... Or me and my shatter. Well, babyface Boris Badanov and his gang, the light-fingered five minus two, have successfully plundered the Frostbite Falls Bank and are making their getaway in a 1910 Stern's Night Runabout. This is a getaway car, babyface. It's pretty slow, boss. Don't worry, boys. This was fastest car in Frostbite Falls. How do you know? Was only car in Frostbite Falls. And back in town, Bullwinkle and the bank president wait for Rocky to return, unaware that he has been knocked out while flying and is directly above them hurtling toward the ground unconscious. But Bullwinkle, suppose those crooks try to hurt Rocky. Then with my own two hands, I'll... Ooh. You what, Bullwinkle? Rocky! It's not like you to drop in so unexpected. Uh-oh, he's hurt, Bullwinkle. We better get him to a hospital. And in a little while, Rocky was being examined at the Cochiching County Hospital. How is he, Doc? What's the matter? Well, your friend has a frontal tumescent edema with capillary suffusion. That does it! They can't do that to my buddy. I'm personally going to tear them crooks from limb to limb. And the furious moose dashed out of the hospital on his mission of revenge. What was it you said I had, doctor? Well, in non-medical terms, you've got a bump on the head. Hokey smoke. Bullwinkle! But it was too late. Bullwinkle was already on his bicycle heading out of town and after Babyface and his mob. Fortunately for his efforts, the Stern's Night runabout was very easy to follow, for it dropped a constant trail of nuts and bolts behind it. As a result, when one of the thugs chanced to look back... Hey, Babyface, somebody's following us on a sickle. Motorcycle. Bicycle. Impossible. But no, Bullwinkle was pumping furiously and actually gaining on the car as it roared over a twisting mountain road. Faster, Spike, faster! It won't go no faster, baby face. Then quick, give me my book. Your book? This is no time to catch up on your reading. It's time for this reading. Look. The golden treasury of fiendish plans. <laughs> right. And here is plan number one. And Boris began to sprinkle carpet tacks and razor blades out of the back of the speeding car. Bullwinkle's tires were instantly punctured and torn to shreds. <laughs> But he never faltered. In a few seconds, he was running on the rims and coming closer than ever. In desperation, Boris piled up every bit of loose trash in the getaway car and shoved the pile out the back. Uh-oh! Looks like a second-hand store coming at me. Fortunately for Bullwinkle, the first thing he hit was the rear seat. Instantly, he took off, flew clear over the rest of the trash, and landed even closer to the car. Oh, boy, some book this is. And the disappointed Boris tossed out his copy of the Golden Treasury of Fiendish Plan. Oop! In a second, Bullwinkle's bike skidded off the road and down a mountainside. Great work, boss. Oh, it was nothing any cold-blooded American gangster wouldn't have done. But at that moment, Bullwinkle's bike came out on a lower level of the mountain road, and when Boris's car turned a corner... Babyface, look! He's ahead of us! Oh, boy! Gee, I must be going faster than I thought. I passed him without even seeing him. Well, now what, babyface? Wait till I figure out who's chasing who. But Boris's problem was soon solved, for at that moment, a tiny chipmunk scurried out on the road ahead of Bullwinkle's bike. Of course, the soft-headed, soft-hearted moose jammed on the brakes and skidded to a halt. There you are, little belly. Go ahead. Look out! <laughs> it pays to be courteous because... Ooh! Well, what will be the outcome of this horrendous smash-up? We'll see next time in Hop, Skip, and Junk, or Bullwinkle's Big Toe. Well, Colonel McCornpone didn't know what he was starting when he sponsored a treasure hunt for a pot containing a million dollars in Confederate money. Not only did the citizens of Frostbite Falls dig the streets full of holes, but the light-fingered five minus two took advantage of the situation to rob the town bank. Bullwinkle was pursuing them closely, but when he took a shortcut down a mountainside, he wound up in front of the car he was chasing. Of course, when he stopped suddenly to let an elderly chipmunk cross the road, a collision was inevitable. Inhovitable? Uh, that means it was bound to happen. Hey, you right! The leader of the gang, Babyface Braunschweiger... Alias you-know-who... Uh, ...was just picking himself up when Bullwinkle approached. Oh, for Daisy's sake, let me help you! You? You're helping me? Of course. You mean you don't remember what happened? Certainly. Let's see, uh... You don't remember what you were doing before the accident? Well, of course I was, uh... 
I was looking for this very treasure he's worth. Babyface. He's forgotten why he's chasing us. Uh, yeah, fella, you, you was really pleased. Let's not look a gift moose in the mouth. Can I help you with your thing? Sure enough, crashing into that tree branch had driven all memory of the bank robbery out of Bullwinkle's mind. That's no drive, more of a short pot. And in a few moments, the robbers were on their way again in the battered Stern's night runabout. You got the loot, baby face? Right here in this valley, Spike. A hundred thousand delicious dollars. Little did Boris know that he had taken Bullwinkle's valise by mistake and that he... Hey, you! What are you whispering about it? Uh, oh, 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 nothing. Well, stop it. Uh, yes, sir. But meanwhile, back at the moose, an identical valise lay at Bullwinkle's feet as he waved bye-bye to the departing thug. So long. Have a nice trip. And Bullwinkle sat down on the suitcase to ponder the possible position of the buried treasure. Now, let's see. Where would I hide a million dollars in Confederate money? At that moment in the Cochichin County Hospital, his pal Rocky was saying... But I just gotta follow Bullwinkle. I'm sorry, Mr. Squirrel. Doctor's orders are to keep you under observation. But that's easy. And a few moments later, Rocky zoomed out of the hospital window while inside he was still under close observation on television. That's nice. No temperature. Bullwinkle, meantime, was puzzling out the latest clue to the hidden Confederate money. The Picayune pot is not obese. It's about the size of a straw valise. Hmm. Must be the same size as this here suitcase. And sure enough, as he picked up the valise, it fell open and the astonished Bullwinkle was up to his moose hocks in money. Oh, boy! Of course, his adult brain didn't recognize it as the stolen bank money. To him, it was only... The Picayune pot! I found it! Oh, boy! But then as he looked at the bills more closely, Bullwinkle mm -hmm. became a little puzzled. Hmm. This doesn't look like real Confederate money to me. At last, light was dawning in Bullwinkle's brain. He realized at last what he really held in his hand. Yes, it's counterfeit Confederate money. Oh, dear. And Bullwinkle scraped the money together. Well, most of it anyway, and started off down the road, leaving a trail of perfectly good $10 bills behind him. Well, easy come, easy go. <laughs> oh, the waste. And what will Boris do when he finds that the suitcase he holds contains four pairs of socks and a couple of peanut butter sandwiches? You're whispering again. Speak up or... Uh, uh, be with us next time for Bucks for Boris or the Green Paper Caper. <laughs> That's better. Well, the search for the Picayune pot containing a million dollars in Confederate money had some unexpected complications, didn't it? The bank was robbed, Rocky was sent to the hospital, and Bullwinkle was chasing the bandits on his bicycle. He had a slight controversy with a tree trunk, though, and forgot why he was following Babyface Braunschweiger and his light-fingered five minus two. As a result, when he opened the robber's suitcase instead of his own and found it stuffed with greenbacks, he could only find one reason for it. It's counterfeit Confederate money. And Bullwinkle carelessly began to lug the suitcase back to town, little realizing that those $10 bills fluttering in the breeze were real, honest-to-goodness U.S. money. Meanwhile, Babyface Braunschweiger had reached his hideout and was preparing to divide the loot. He didn't know that he had Bullwinkle's suitcase containing three pairs of socks and a peanut butter sandwich. Come on, Babyface, quit stalling. Yeah, come across what I share before we get annoyed. Tot, tot, fellows. Do I look like Double Crosser? Yes. yes. Just asking. <laughs> well, we'll just open. Ooh. What's the matter? On second thought, why don't we wait till later to the widen? How much later? How about next Groundhog's Day? If I see my shadow, we open suitcase. And if you don't? Well, there's other Groundhog Days. Baby face, it sounds like you're welching on our deal. You know what we do to welchers? Let's get him, guys. Things really looked bad for Boris until he said, Gentlemen, if I'm welching on you, may lightning strike me this minute. But amazing though it may seem, when the air cleared, the only man left unharmed was Boris Badenov himself. Not so amazing, Gluck. Good heavens, a lightning rod. Certainly. With my reputation, I can't afford to take chances. Of course, it didn't take Boris long to figure out what had happened. Hmm. If I got peanut butter sandwich, moose must have money. And Boris prepared to leave. Oh, what will he do to our friend Bullwinkle? Don't do it. Meanwhile, Rocky had left the hospital and was zooming through the air searching for his pal. Gee, I can't see him anywhere. Hey, Bullwinkle! Of course, the plucky squirrel's voice would not carry far enough, but Rocky was equal to the occasion. He pulled out a genuine Frostbite Falls Mother Moose call. Mm.
Far away, Bullwinkle was amusing himself and breaking a federal law by cutting out pictures of the presidents. They look keen in my scrapbook. Suddenly, a strange sound came floating through the air. <laughs> yes, it was a blast from the Mother Moose call. Bullwinkle's response was instantaneous. Coming, Mother. <laughs> Drawn by the irresistible appeal of the Moose call, Bullwinkle drew nearer and nearer to his friend. But unfortunately for our heroes, somebody else had heard that Moose call. <laughs> Somebody who wished no good for our friends. Somebody who... Stop with the somebody who already. Give the name. Very well. Boris Badenov. <laughs> Ta-da! Had also heard the sound and whipped out a small but invaluable anthology, The Pocketbook of Fiendish Plan. Oh, boy. And just a short distance away... <laughs> you called? Hokey Smoke, who are you? Allow me to introduce myself, Yankee. Only child, Moose Moose. Pride from the Everglades. Honey child, Moose Moose. Yep, just arrived from below the Moose and Dixon line. Well, I'm pleased to meet you, Miss Honey Child. And so Rocky's gallantry and good manners take him close to fearful jeopardy. Is that fearful J jeopardy? Don't miss our next episode when Moose meets Moose or Two's a Crowd. Well, Bullwinkle has been having a wonderful time with that trunk full of Confederate money he found. He's been sailing paper airplanes made of $50 bills, even cutting out paper dolls of $10 each. Little does he know that it isn't Confederate money at all, but real United States currency stolen from the town bank. Boy, look at that one go! Rocky has been searching for him frantically and finally resorts to using a Frostbite Falls Mother Moose call. The sound of it reached Bullwinkle as he was flying a kite made of $100 bills. <laughs> Coming, Mother. But when Rocky blew again, <laughs> it wasn't Bullwinkle who showed up at all. You called? Pokey Smoke, who are you? Allow me to introduce myself. Honey Child Moose Moss from way below the Moose and Dixon line. Gee, welcome to Minnesota, Miss Moose Moss. Rocky behaved like a little gentleman, but Honey Child didn't act like a lady at all. Fortunately, she was stopped by a strange sound. <laughs> well, how did you do, do? Did you find the bank robbers and the money? How about introducing me to your bank robbers? Now I remember. Yes, it seemed that Bullwinkle's period of amnesia was over. Did I find the money? Boy, have I got a surprise for you, Rock. And Bullwinkle grabbed the straw valise and flung it open. Well? Well, aren't you surprised at what's in there? Three pairs of socks and a peanut butter sandwich. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, indeed. Honey Child Moose Moss, alias Babyface Braunschweiger... Alias Boris Bedenov. ...had traded suitcases with Bullwinkle and now had possession of the valise full of money. And now it's bye-bye, Boris. But as the disguised villain started off... Hey, what's your hurry, little missy? Well, I gotta go way down upon the Swanee River. To see the old folks at home, huh? Hey, Bullwinkle, that valise looks just like yours. How about that? Small world, isn't it, mister? Her name's Honey Child Moose Moss. Of the Florida Moose Mosses. I just knew you were from the South on account of your Southern fried accent. Um, no offense, Miss Moose Moss, but could we see inside your suitcase? Sir, no Southern gentleman ever peeking inside ladies' pocketbook. That's a pocketbook? Large economy size. Gee. Maybe I didn't have the money after all, Rock. Yeah. Maybe I dreamed it. Yeah. Maybe I'm just a stupid lame brain. Yeah. Couldn't you hesitate a little on that one? Well, I really must be going, yo. Yeah. While it was a clear-cut victory for Boris until a strange object floated down near our friends. Bullwinkle, it's a kite made a hundred dollar bills. Must be the deluxe model, and that ain't... Hey, that's my kite. Right. You did have the money, Bullwinkle. I think I hear my dear old mammy calling Caroline. But your name's Honey Child. That's my maiden name. Well, so long, Yankees. Grab that suitcase, Bullwinkle. And as Boris sped away, Bullwinkle seized the valise. Good work. Yeah. Open it up. Right. What's in it? Three pairs of socks and a peanut butter sandwich. Bullwinkle, she tricked us. Yeah, them southern meese are pretty slick. After her, Bullwinkle. <laughs> The pleasure. But in a few steps, Bullwinkle stopped short. Look there, Rock! Sure enough, on a nearby bush was Boris's false wig and antlers. You know what that means, Bullwinkle? Yeah, she's been scalped. No, no. Confound them Apaches anyway. Listen, it. We'll head them off at the pass. Bullwinkle, hmm? it's a wig. She wasn't a real blonde. She wasn't a real moose. She wasn't even a real she. Well, will Boris make it to the train station and escape unscathed? On what? Uh, we'll find out next time in the Midnight Choo Choo or This Gum for Hire. 
Well, our heroes got awfully close to the missing bank money last time. Close, but not near enough, for Boris Badenov, disguised as a lady moose, made off with a satchel full of swag, leaving our two heroes with an identical valise containing three pairs of socks and a peanut butter sandwich. Well, I only got one thing to say. What's that? Halfies on the sandwich. Little did our friends know that as they munched the sandwich, they were the target of three pairs of sinister eyes belonging to the light-fingered five minus two. Is that the uh, satchel three-finger? Yeah, but where's the double cross some baby face? These guys must have knocked him off. Well, let's swipe the suitcase and then blast them. Uh, how about blasting them first and then swiping the suitcase? Meanwhile, babyface Braunschweiger, alias Boris Badenov, had reached the Frostbite Falls Railroad Station. Quick, what time leaves the next train for Skinniapolis? He should be along about half past. Good, I'll wait. You want to buy a ticket? You sell it, kiddo, and I'll pay for it with this. I, 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 of course. Here you are. Just a minute, chum. You forgot to give me mine change. And under the menace of Boris's weapon, the clerk had to hand over the entire receipts for the day. Mm, not bad. Here's a tip for crooks and bandits everywhere. Next time, try the train. Meanwhile, a short distance away, the three hoodlums were creeping nearer and nearer our friends. Hmm, that was mighty tasty, Rocky. Any seconds on the peanut butter sandwiches? I don't think so, but let's look. And Rocky opened the straw valise. Nothing left but three pairs of socks, Bullwinkle. I'd rather have a sandwich. Well... Let's get back to town, Bullwinkle. You see that slug? The money's gone. Yeah, that means Babyface has pulled a triple cross. Well, do I blast them? Of course not. They don't have the money. Oh, I could use a pair of socks. Never mind. We gotta find Babyface. But back at the train station, Babyface was gazing up the track, waiting for the next train out of town. I thought you said train was due half past. Jeez. Half past four or half past five? Half past October. October? Raskalnikov. But it'll be right on time, give or take a week. A week? Oh, boy. I could run to Skinniapolis quicker than that. And grabbing his suitcase full of loot, Boris started off down the tracks. But in a moment, he had spotted something that brought him to a halt. For there on the siding was a small handcar. In a few seconds, Boris was pumping the handcar toward the big city and safety. Yeah, he sort of do-it-myself railroad. Little did he know that just ahead was a grade crossing where Rocky and Bullwinkle were just preparing to pass over the tracks. Just a second, Rocky. What is it, Bullwinkle? Can't be too careful crossing railroad tracks, you know. You always stop, look, and... Listen. Bullwinkle, are you all right? I'm not making book on it, but I think so. Yes, Bullwinkle's mighty frame had survived the impact. Not so the handcar. Gee, Bullwinkle, it's a total loss. And here's the fellow that was on it. It's that gangster. He's unconscious. You know, I'll bet his first words when he comes to will be, Where am I? How come? That's what I always say. But just then, Boris's eyes opened and he said, Stick him up. Well, that's different, Bullwinkle. Yeah, but it's not much of an improvement. But we haven't done anything, Mr... Braunschweiger. Babyface Braunschweiger. Haven't we met before, Mr. Babyface? Have we met before? Oh, boy. But we're not going to meet again. How can you be sure? It's such a small world. Yeah, but you won't be in it. Well, is Boris really going to finish off our heroes? And if so, what will happen to our show? Be with us next time for Boris Madinov and his friends. Well, in their efforts to return the stolen money to the Farmers and Swineherds National Bank, our heroes have run across an unexpected development. Or rather, it ran across them. The man on the handcar was, of course, Boris Badenov, alias Babyface Braunschweiger, who was escaping with the satchel full of loot. You busy bodies have busied your last body. Things look bad for our friends till a voice spoke up behind Boris. All right, Babyface, drop the cat. It's, it's my game. Right, Babyface, till I think of five minus two. You wouldn't be taking a little run-out powder, would you, boss? Okay, Babyface, up my voice. Look, let's split this swag right down the middle, huh? Even Steven, ain't it wanty? But when Boris opened the satchel, the thugs seem disappointed in the contents. You can have my share, baby face. I can? Sure, what's one sock, more or less? A sock? Sure enough, all there was inside the valise were three pairs of socks. Some no good, no good, they sweet suitcases on me. But who? Who else? Them. Them who? Those them who, 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 boy, they're gone. Yes, our quick-witted heroes had switched suitcases, vanished from the scene, and at that moment were zooming toward town on Boris's own handcar. Faster, Bullwinkle. we got to get this money back to the bank. Of course, Babyface and his gang weren't idle. They steered their Stern's Night Roadster onto the tracks and took off after the fleeing handcar. But the thieves had reckoned without Bullwinkle's reserves of mighty moose muscle. With a final burst of speed, he reached the station, went right through it, left the railroad tracks, and crashed directly into the wall of the Farmers and Swineherd's Bank. 
Well, we made it, Rocky. I'm not so sure, Bullwinkle. Look there. Sure enough, the hands of a nearby clock pointed to exactly 3 p.m. Uh-oh. Hey, let us in, Mr. Frambley. Sorry, Rocky. It's after 3. Bank's closed. But we got this money. No deposits after 3 o'clock. But it's your money. Banking hours start at 10 tomorrow. I always wondered why banks were called institutions. Now I know. Now we got to figure out how to get rid of this money, Bullwinkle. Funny, I never had this trouble before. Hey, let's take it to the sheriff's office. Maybe he can help. But Rocky was doomed to disappointment. So we thought you might keep this money in a nice, safe cell. Sorry, boys. I can't arrest a satchel full of money. I just arrest people. Yeah. Of course, I could arrest one of you. And if you just happen to have a satchel with you... Swell, go ahead. Nope. First, you have to do something wrong. Wrong? Sir, you are speaking of a couple of genuine TV-type heroes. Can't do anything wrong, eh? It's in our contract. But at that moment, the handle of the worrisome suitcase broke and it fell on Bullwinkle's foot. Oh! That does it. And in a twinkling, Bullwinkle found himself and the money safely behind bars in a basement cell. How come? How come? Disturbing the peace. Whose? Mine. Oh. Good work, Bullwinkle. Oh, don't thank me. Thank my sensitive type Tootsie. Little did our friends know that just outside the barred window, that arch fiend Boris Badenov had overheard everything. Well, gang, is only one way to get money. Don't tell me we gotta... Exactly. We're going to break into jail. Into jail? Are you out of your mind, baby face? Leave us not the fire against nature, boss. Besides, how do we do it? Easy. I got plan right here. Well, that's a plan for breaking out of jail. Of course. We just follow plan backward. But what do we do about the moose? In a word, gentlemen. And the villains prepared to carry out their nefarious scheme. Oh, this bodes no good for our friends. This bodes ill for the bank, too. It bodes... Hey, you. Uh, yes? Sit down. You're rocking the boat. Be with us next time for Bars of Steel or The Hard Sell. Believe it or not, it all started with a newspaper publicity stunt. The Frostbite Falls Picayune Intelligence buried a million dollars in Confederate money and offered a prize to the person who could find it. The town was soon full of holes, one of which was dug right under the town bank by babyface Braunschweiger and his gang. When they escaped with their stolen loot, Rocky and Bullwinkle tracked them down and got it back. Now Bullwinkle is sitting in a basement cell in the sheriff station, waiting for the bank to open. Outside, Babyface... Or as we know him, Boris Bedenov... ...is planning to break into the jail and get the loot back again. But that's a plan for breaking out of jail, Babyface. Of course, we just follow plan backward. Well, it work. You seen one jail break, you seen them all. First, we crash through gate in East Wall. Come on! But Boris's brilliant plan failed in just one detail. There was no gate in the East Wall. I got better idea. We get Sheriff to invite us into jail. Invite us? How? Easy. All we got to do is get arrested. Of course. You done it again, Chief. Now, here is plan. We find policeman A. Then, Spike, you break streetlight. B. Three finger, you take big stick and hit little old lady C. And slug, you draw a mustache on picture of pretty girl D. And what do you do, baby face? Shoot slingshot at policeman A. Then we're all arrested and wind up in jail next to suitcase money. Okay? Baby face, you're a cotton pick and jewel. You sad it, kiddo. Now everybody ready? Right. You bet. Three, two, one, zero. And Boris let fly with a slingshot at Policeman A. Unfortunately, he missed and hit Spike, whose rock then flew past Streetlight B and struck Three Finger in the head. As a result, he missed the little old lady C and caught his slug, who dropped his chalk before defacing the pretty girl D. The effect on Boris was immediate. He fainted. Now, that's the way I like to see things. Nice and quiet. But the wily villain couldn't be kept down for long. You bet. Now I start from bottom up. And furiously began to dig a tunnel under the jailhouse wall. Meanwhile, in his small cell in the basement, Bullwinkle was sitting on the suitcase full of cash while Rocky stood guard right outside. I'd just like to see anybody get this money now. Yeah. It's as safe as if it was in the Bank of Oop. The Bank of Oop? Where's that for... What happened, Bullwinkle? Must be termites, Rock! They'd have to be awful big ones. They are! One of them's trying to grab the suitcase away from me. Well, hang on, Bullwinkle. I'll bring the sheriff. Yeah! But as you can guess, it wasn't termites under the floor at all, but that arch-fiend Boris Badenov. Give me that suitcase. Uh-oh, a talking termite. Let go of suitcase, you big boob. In dialect yet. Let go yourself, you thieving, scoundrelly insect. Flattery will get you nowhere. Let go! Never! Then I must resort to secret weapon number 237. What's that? This. And Boris produced a large feather and began to tickle Bullwinkle's feet. <laughs>
Oh, 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 stop it, stop it, oh no, hey, stop! Drop suitcase! <laughs> I'll die first! <laughs> then you'll die laughing! Kitsy, kitsy, kitsy! Oh Ooh. no! <laughs> and at last, weakened by laughter, Bullwinkle's grip loosened and Boris dashed off with a suitcase full of stolen mo money. Will Boris escape with his ill gotten gains? We'll find out in our next laugh filled episode! <laughs> Who's tickling you? A subway finish or an underground round? Last time you remember, Bullwinkle was gutting the suitcase full of stolen bank money when suddenly the bottom dropped out of the plot. Oop! Termites! But no, frantically tugging on the suitcase was our old nemesis, Boris Vedanov. Let go, you stupid moose! I'm not giving up to no talking termite! Fortunately, the sheriff was outside Bullwinkle's cell and heard the commotion. He immediately went to the moose's aid. But unfortunately, Boris's gang also arrived on the scene. Fortunately, Rocky zoomed in looking for the sheriff, but unfortunately... Make up your mind, will you? Get him in it! Oh, Alice, oh, get him in Hey, baby face! Baby face, I got it! I got the suitcase! Then let's get out of here! And led by Boris, the light-fingered five minus two dashed out of the hole, dragging the suitcase with them. They were quickly followed by our friends who gained rapidly on the fleeing thieves. Quick, pass me the loot! And the thieves tossed the suitcase to Boris just before they were brought down by our friends. Good work, Rocky. We've captured everybody except the ringleader. Oh, we can always track him down, Sheriff. How do you know that? Look, he's leaving a trail of hundred-dollar bills. And it was true. The flimsy straw valise had sprung a leak, and Boris was leaving a trail of money behind him as he fled. Hmm, seems to be getting lighter. I must be catching my second win. Well, that's certainly a break for us, Rocky. I don't think so, Sheriff. Look there! Sure enough, a slight breeze had come up and the money was being blown all over town. Of course, this didn't go unnoticed by the citizens. Now, there's something you don't see every day, Chauncey. What's that, Edgar? The wind blowing money down the street. Oh, I don't know, Edgar. We always get a little breeze in the afternoon. We gotta get those green bags. Don't you have one too many backs in there? How can we get them, Rocky? They're blowing all over. You leave it to me, Sheriff. Sure. And the brainy squirrel dashed into a nearby appliance store and returned with a super-powered vacuum cleaner. Rocky, this is no time to worry about being neat. But in a few seconds, Rocky had strapped the cleaner to his back. Now, give me a boost up, Bullwinkle. I've got some cleanup work to do. So Bullwinkle seized Rocky and tossed him into the air like a small gray javelin. Rocky turned on the vacuum, and in a dazzling display of aerial acrobatics, gathered in bill after bill. You know, for someone who lives on a diet of nuts, he's pretty smart. And he's my friend. Well, he can't be all smart. Then, after gathering all the loose bills, Rocky zoomed off on Boris's trail, scooping up the money as he went. Back at the jail, the sheriff was giving Bullwinkle his instructions. Put these three guys in the cooler, Bullwinkle. I'm going to help Rocky. Okay, Sheriff. Come on, you fellas. And Bullwinkle marched the three desperados right through the jail to a large ice house behind it. Hey, what's the idea, buddy? The sheriff wants you in the cooler, and that's where you're going. Hey, what'll we do, Slug? Yeah, it's freezing in here. It's as cold as ice. It is ice. Oh, yeah. Now, listen, you guys, I got an idea. Hey, hey, Moose, it's dark in here. What do you mean, dark? There's a light in there. Yeah, but when you close the door, it goes out. It does? I always wondered about that. Sure. Look for yourself. Okay. And while Bullwinkle stared at the light bulb, the three hoodlums closed the door on him. Uh-oh. I've been flim-flam. That's right. By the flimsiest kind of a flam. That's right. Them fellers tricked me. That's right. Look, it didn't go off at all. And while the icicles slowly formed on the mighty moose, the light-fingered five minus two dashed off free as birds. What an ending to a simple little newspaper publicity stunt. Don't miss our next episode, the last edition, or Five Scar Final. Well, the Frostbite Falls newspaper really started something when it buried a pot full of Confederate money as a promotional stunt. Within a week, the town was dug full of holes, the bank was robbed, and Bullwinkle was locked up by a gang of thieves. Meanwhile, the gang leader, Boris Badenov, was heading for the hills, turning a valise that leaked hundred-dollar bills. Close behind, Rocky was scooping them up with a powerful vacuum cleaner. Unfortunately, the machine was a little too powerful. Uh-oh! Excuse me, Mr. Braunschweiger. I thought you were a hundred-dollar bill. Name is Babyface, not Bill. But then Boris spotted his empty suitcase. Raskolnikov, I've been hijacked by carpet sweeper. And he started off after the fleeing Rocky. Uh-oh! I gotta find some place to hide this money. But where? Then Rocky's sharp eye spotted a small building on a back street. That's it! The old ice house. Nobody'd ever think to go in there. Gee, Rock, I thought you'd never show up. Bullwinkle, what are you doing here? 
far as I can tell, I'm freezing to death. Come on, we gotta hide this vacuum cleaner full of money. How about putting it under this loose board? Yeah, but that board isn't loose. <laughs> now it is. Good, I'll just put... Uh-oh, there's something here already. Something to do with the plot, I'll bet. I'll say, look! Oh, it's just an ordinary pot full of Confederate money. Bullwinkle, it's the Picayune Pot. Isn't it, though? I all... The Picayune Pot! Then we win the prize! Yeah! Now we've only got one problem! What's that? Staying alive to collect it! What's so tough about that? Well, I'll tell you, buddy! Yike! Yike, indeed, for there in the room with them stood Boris Badenov. Okay, Squirrel, hand over that vacuum cleaner. Never! Here, catch, Bowinkle! Got it, Rock! <laughs> the money flew out, Boris seized it and had it for the door. No, sir, Mr. Babyface Braunschweiger! You won't get by me! <laughs> Watch carefully. <laughs> Prime March is on. And Boris dashed out through the doorway. Rocky, he got away. We're gonna have another unhappy ending. I don't think so, Bullwinkle. How come? Well, you see, that's not the door to outside. It's not. I tricked him. Read the sign. Ice making room, keep out, danger. Rocky, you've did it again. So a short time later, our friend stood with the sheriff outside the ice house. Well, we've got three of the crooks in the clink, Rocky. But what happened to the bank's money? Just watch. <laughs> What do you know? Frozen assets. But what about Babyface Braunschweiger? Coming right up, Sheriff. And that was as near as the arch fiend ever again came to the bank's money. The next day, he was shipped, ice and all, to the state Huskow. And our boys, heroes to the end, collected the prize for finding the Picayune pot, a genuine reconditioned Stern's Night runabout. There's only one thing wrong, boys. What's that? There's so many holes dug in the street, there's no place to drive it. But a little thing like that didn't bother our friends. And soon, Bullwinkle was thoroughly enjoying driving his new old car, even though he wasn't going in. Anywhere. Hold it right there, Rocky. How come, Bullwinkle? I like to watch the sunset. Look out! It's tipping over! And so as the sun slowly sets over Bullwinkle, we take leave of our heroes. Be with us next time for the further adventures of Rocky the Flying Squirrel. <laughs> Time has just about run out. Just enough left to tell him who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Ooh.